Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's talk. I'm Aaron Falous, founder of Promotable and your host for this evening's event. Um, before we get started, uh, just gonna make a couple of announcements um, and then we'll, we'll hand it off to our speaker. Um, and then from there, we'll answer all of, our, all of your questions at the end. Um, though I do encourage you um, during the talk, please try and put all of your questions into the comment section, either on LinkedIn um, or you can go ahead as well and um, tweet us your questions as well. I'm including our Twitter here at the bottom. Um, so feel free to do either of those. We'll collect all of those and then during the Q&A portion, um, we'll go ahead and address all of your questions. And then uh, of course, like feel free even during Q&A to add uh, additional questions. We, we, we blocked off the hour. Um, so we've got plenty of time to, to do all that. Um, with that said, thanks everyone for coming. I know there's lots of other places you can be, lots of other webinars to listen to. Um, so I, I definitely appreciate it. Um, as I said before, I'm, I'm Aaron and I'm gonna be your host for tonight. Um, so, um, you know, we do these about once a week. Uh, we try and do them you know, as often as we can. Uh, the most important thing really is we you know, like to bring uh, you know, data analytics practitioners to talk about what they do every single day. Um, so promotable, um, we're a workforce accelerator. We focus on closing that data skills gap. Um, so we do that through uh, free events like today. I'm sure I know I see a few familiar faces. So I know some of you have been, have been to our previous talks. Um, and so we do these all the time. Our goal is to bring in folks from different backgrounds, different industries, um, all to talk about data, what they do, and then also, of course, to help demystify that and help bring relevant examples and best practices for you. Um, and so, you know, next week we've got additional talk on machine learning. Uh, we've got a few more down the pipeline, so look out for our emails. Um, in addition, um, anyone, if you guys are on LinkedIn, uh, we'd really appreciate it. You can give us a like or a follow. Uh, and that's super helpful. Um, last announcement, um, for anyone who wants to dive deeper into data, uh, if, you're, if you're not technical, you might be in marketing or product or finance, um, we do have a data analytics course. Uh, it's live online, five hours a week. Uh, Instructors are all current practitioners. In this case, uh, he's a data science lead at Northwestern Mutual. Uh, we have five hours a week. You'll learn things like SQL, Tableau, um, and stats, and more. So if you're curious, feel free to check us out at www.promotable.io. Um, and again, before I hand it back off to our speaker, um, please go ahead and remember to either live tweet us with your questions or throw those into the comment section. Um, and with that, Let's bring on Kenny. Um, here we go. Um, hey Kenny, thanks for coming on. I'm gonna bring your screen up. And here we go. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, just a quick check in, 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 is my screen being shared? Can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah, it, it, it is Kenny. Okay, great. Uh, and thank you all for being here, I think, um, you know, uh, really wish we could have done this in person, but uh, in these strange times, I guess this, you know, this, will, this is the next best thing. Uh, that being said, I will apologize in advance if um, if we hear kids screaming or dogs barking in the background. <laughs> it's just the nature of things these days. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I've got over uh, two decades of work in data and analytics. Uh, I started out um, working on back when we did large scale data warehouse implementations uh, that moved into um, enterprise analytics solutions, implementations, and more recently, uh, I focus a lot of my time on, um, on data strategies for financial services uh, clients. Um, what, I, what I get excited about is um, not just the, not, you know, not, not just the, the data and the techniques and, and methods that we can, we can use, but actually applying them to some, to some business problem. Uh, some real world uh, uh, solution, and so that you know, process mining is a good is a good example of that. So um, that's what I that's what uh, I want to talk about today. Um, the, the way that I think about uh, process mining, the way I sort of describe it is, it's sort of a, a combination uh, between data mining and process and business process management. Um, and so what we'll do today is I'll just we'll just do a quick. Uh, intro into what is business process management, and then talk about process mining and how it works and how it complements business process management. Uh, and then a little bit into data mining and how that helps, uh, and, and why I say it's a cross between, you know, between data mining and, and, and BPM or business process management. 
I won't go too deep into any of the, those areas just because I know this is a, uh, we want to focus this more on, on process mining. Um, but after that, you know, we'll get into uh, some benefits and, and why you would do process mining. We'll talk about examples just from the real world of how uh, companies have used process mining. And then if you're thinking about uh, eventually doing something like this at your own organization, just some key considerations or things that, that I've learned along the way, um, things that you just need to keep in mind as, as, you, as you think about process mining. So let's dive uh, right into it. First, just quickly on business process management. I think uh, it, you'll see why I'd like to just ground everyone on what that is first. And, and um, you know, if this is sort of new to you, I think you can, you can think of a business process as anything with a, it's, it's a set of related activities with a defined start and end <clears throat> where you're accomplishing some business goal. So a good example of this might be something like, um, you know, when you go when you go return something at, at uh, on an online retailer, the, the process that kick, gets kicked off when you when you submit a re the return and get the refund, or the process that a company follows when you know when it's time to pay an invoice from the time that the invoice gets created until the approvals go through until the time that the invoice is paid. Uh, if you look at the right side of the um, of the slide, you know there there's there's industry standard notation about how these things are documented. And so you have symbols that represent starts, you have, you have symbols that represent an activity, and then you have diamonds in there uh, without that represent some decision that needs to be made, not unlike a, you know, a flow chart that you would normally see. So that, that diamond you see on there might be something like, uh, is the invoice over a million dollars? If so, it's got to kick off some other process to get approved. If not, we can go ahead and kick off the payment process. Uh, and then within there, you, you'll see swim lanes uh, that represent either people or departments within a company that are that are um, the, uh, that are that are completing each activity. And so that together is what we would call a process map. Business process management. Then really, all that is is um, uh, the the management of these processes and and trying to make them uh, as lean and as efficient as possible. Um, on the on the left hand side, just a quick crash course on uh, on business process management. I, I think it's it started back in in uh, 1776. A guy, an economist by the name of Adam Smith, uh, wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations, and he was sort of the first one to introduce this concept of uh, division of labor. And he you know he was able to theoretically prove out that uh, it's much better, it's much more advantageous for an economy as a whole. For people to specialize in certain tasks as opposed to everybody just doing everything. Um, and so that, you know, that was built upon by uh, Henry Ford when he built a Model T. He, he used the concept of a, which was new at the time, an assembly line to cut the cost of the building the car in half. You fast forward into to Bell Labs and to engineers at Toyota uh, that, that did a lot of the, you know, infusing um, statistics into the processes and, and, and assembly lines. Um, and then Motorola, who pioneered um, uh, Six Sigma concepts, and then eventually to, to GE, who, you know, they were sort of like the, the big adopters of, of the Six Sigma. By the time they did, right around the mid-90s, I think most of the fortune, most of the large companies uh, were using Six Sigma, Six Sigma in some way or another. And, and that's basically just a, a method of uh, taking all of the, the inefficiencies out of a process and making it as lean uh, and efficient as possible. So that's, uh, that's you know, there's a whole science behind this. There, there are tools out in the marketplace that do this sort of thing. And so that's, that's business process management. Um, one of the things uh, around making processes more efficient though, is, is you, you really have to get a good understanding of, of what your, your business does today so that you can figure out where to focus your efforts on, on ways to make things more efficient. Uh, and so you can do this in a number of ways. You can do this by interviewing process owners to say, you know, when, when, when you kick off a process for paying an invoice, what happens? Who does what? And what are the dependencies? Um, the, the other way, and so you're, you're relying mostly on anecdotal information. I think the other way to do it, there's a, there's a story about how um, at Tesla, when when Elon Musk at Tesla, when they were behind in producing Model 3s, he actually, you know, slept on the 
uh, the production floor just to just to watch what was happening and try to figure out where the inefficiencies were, so he could so he could you know um, so he could make them more efficient and improve them and streamline the processes. So that's another way of doing it is to actually sit not sit there and and observe uh, the processes happening. But I think for both of those ways, you know, you're you're relying on anecdotal information, and also I don't think anybody wants to sleep on the factory floor, you know, for weeks on end to to make uh, streamlined processes. So uh is there a better way and so that's where process mining comes in um pictured here is i think um well his name is professor will vanderals he's sort of looked at as the um as the godfather of process mining he 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 wrote the book on, he literally wrote the book on process mining this is the, on that picture you see is a um uh process mining book that he published in in 2016 that that explained a lot of this and so you know he's got he, he's he's a computer scientist that has that teaches at a, a Aachen University in in Germany. Um, he's probably one of the most cited computer scientists uh, in the world, and um, a lot of the research that he did uh, in in the late 1990s has led to um, you know a lot of the proliferation of process mining tools uh, that you see on the market today. And in fact, he's he sits on the advisory board of a lot of those uh, a lot of those tools. So uh, you know that's that's a little bit of the history. Let's let's now just dive what into what exactly process mining is. And I think very simply stated, you can you can look at it in a series of of three overall steps. Uh, the first step is is first getting access to data and systems. And and so um, you know just a little bit. If I take a step back, um, if you think about the, the the example I always pull up is pull up on is the um, example of how an invoice gets paid at a company. And that, like a lot of other processes at, at other companies, is uh, is tethered to some system. So there's you know there's an accounts payable system that um, that is that has all of this information that actually has event logs that are stored that say when you know uh, Joe on November 15th uh, logged an invoice, and so the status on it is open, and then it was reviewed by you know Sally from Accounts Payable, and so and then that got routed to somebody, and so a, a lot of that you think of that as like the data trail that gets left behind in the in, by the invoice process. That's saved in systems, whether it's an ERP system or whatever process it is, whether it's a CRM system. Those are those are actually I mean event logs that you can tap into. So what? Um, what process mining is 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 basically tapping into those, whether it's connecting directly to the system, or just getting a an extract of the event logs, uh, and then going on to step two, which is which is the actual process mining. And and really what that is is the, the tools that are out there. What they'll do is they'll run algorithms on the event logs, and and they'll spit out um, uh, uh, what is a what would look like very similar to a process map, and I'll show you an example of one in a second here. Um, but you know, you can see, you can right away see there's probably some advantages to this. You don't have to, you don't have to go through the whole interview process. This is, this, it's as data driven. It's based on what's happening in reality, uh, and so you know, um, very quickly you could gain insights into how your how your process is is behaving and 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 what are some ways to either streamline or or, uh, or re-engineer it or change it. Uh, to make it a, a little more real, um, here you see a screenshot of some actual data, and I'll walk through this in a little bit. Um, but it, really, all this is a screenshot of a, of a tool called Disco. Um, it's it's put out by a by a group called Fluxicon, and this is you know what I fired up as using their demo version. There's a lot. There's some there's some freeware out there. There's some open source tools out there as well. Uh, they're a little more academic, um, and there's a lot of you know obviously like enterprise scale um, process mining tools as well. But this is just one example. And so what I did is I loaded some demo data into here. And if you look here, um, in order to run process mining, uh, really all you need is three, three, three attributes in, in an event log. You need some sort of case ID that basically identifies uh, every case that's going through the process, uh, uniquely identifies it. Um, you need some sort of activity or status column. That's the second one there. Uh, that basically says, you know, what what state that case is in at the time. And then you need some timestamp that just says, I mean, it could be either uh, the time that just on that first example there. Uh, that's the timestamp for when the order was created. 
Um, but you could have the timestamp for when it left that status, or you could even have start and end times, which is which is even better because then you can see gaps between uh, between statuses. But but that's it. A minimum of three uh, three attributes. There, there's a bunch of stuff on the right hand side there uh, that you could also load into a process mining tool. Things like what employee uh, performed that task or you know, what channel through which they performed it. And I'll get into why you would do that in a little bit. And that's sort of like extra, uh, extra things that we'll get into a little bit. But to, to, do, to just come up with a, a base process uh, map, really, you just need those three, those three columns. And what ends up happening then is it'll, it'll run all the alg algorithms that, it, that we talked about earlier, and, and it'll spit out something that looks like this, which is a process which you can see here, it starts to look like a process map. So you can see that order got created and there are two branches. Uh, at, you know, in this example, 765 of the invoice, the, of the orders went through the left-hand branch and 263 went through the right-hand side. So it's a very easy visual way to see this. There's a lot of extra features that, uh, depending on the process mining tool you use, will, they'll make available for, for example, you could change, right now it's set to look at frequencies, but if you, in my invoicing example, if you instead of what, didn't want to see the number of invoices, but you wanted to see something like the dollar amounts on them, you could you could switch that view, and you could see, you know, maybe two of them only only two of them went through this this other branch, but that accounted for eighty percent of of the invoice dollar amounts that we paid, and so we should pay attention to those, even though they didn't happen very often. Some other things you can do on here, um, very common in some other tools, is on the right hand side you can see how I've you can zoom in and out on a, of a picture. Oftentimes, what you'll get when you when you load event logs into a tool like this, it'll just look like a, you know, like a, a spaghetti bowl process, and so it's hard to make heads or tails of it to even know where to start. And so the the dials on the right hand side are ways where you can look at, you know, just the most frequent paths or just the most frequent activities, and you can zoom in and out to, to, to focus in on on those particular ones to at least know where to start. Um, so, so those are, the, you know, that's, that's, that's what, um, that, that's what process mining tools will do. Again, uh, you can see the benefits of this. It's data driven. It reflects reality. It's what actually happened, not what somebody says should happen in the process. Um, and, and the other thing is it'll, you know, it'll catch anomalies that, um, that, that, that you hadn't anticipated where if you interviewed a process owner, they might not even know, uh, there is a path to get to payment of an invoice that they weren't aware of. Um, and so just to just to go back to um, you know the the picture I shared earlier about the three-step process, you know, if you think about it, if you were to interview a process owner and they gave you what the should be process was, to me, if you look at the right hand side of the picture, that's uh, it's a good representation of that. That that keep off the grass sign, that that's the the process owner's should be version of the process. You can see the the trail that's left behind of the people that aren't actually keeping off the grass, and so that's reflective of reality. And so that's what that's what the event logs will give you. And so that's the that's the difference, and that's a, that's a good way to good way to think about that. Um, going back to what I was talking about earlier around only needing three uh, three attributes, um, I talked about some other attributes that you could potentially load into a into a process mining tool, and those are things like you know, uh, resources or, or people or locations of where they happen. The reason why you would want to do something like that is in a lot of these process mining tools, um, they make available uh, dashboards for you. So if you looked at a process and you, and you looked at, you know, one branch of the process and, and it was worth looking into a little more because the timestamps on, on them looked kind of ridiculous, uh, you could dig into it a little more and you could find out maybe maybe the loans that are being originated in in Illinois uh, if you slice the data up you looked at by state and you saw that Illinois was the one that was dra dragging out the timelines and everywhere everywhere else it looked fine well you know it's that's a um, that's that's a sort of diagnostic that you could run using these dashboards if you if you loaded that data you could run to to, to sort of pinpoint where uh, uh, trouble issues are maybe there's a, there's a place where you know Sally from accounting uh, um, didn't progress any of the invoices through, and then you, you match that up and you found oh 
they, well, she was on temporary leave at the time. And so, you know, it's, it's sort of like diagnostic things that you could do to, to, to dig into um, processes just to understand where the problems are a little more. So that's um, that's process mining. I, sorry, yeah, that's process mining. I think um, just a little bit of uh, intro into data mining. I, this was this was good to talk through just because now you'll see why. Um, up at the beginning, I talked about process mining being a, com being a combination of of BPM, um, business process mining, and data mining. And so, it, within data mining, there, there's tons of techniques that you can use to understand and uh, data and use it to predict outcomes. One example is something called uh, decision tree learning. And really what that is, is if you look at that example on the, the lower right, imagine if you were given a table of people and, and in that table you had uh, their age, you had whether they eat pizza or not, you had in there whether they exercise or not, and then you had a last column on that on that sheet that said, how fit they are or whether they're fit or not or unfit. And so you could look at that and you could, you could right away say, you know, if you gave me another name of a person randomly, randomly chosen, I could, based on this data, um, come up with a, with a decision tree like this to help me um, predict whether or not that person was, was unfit or not based on just give me their age, give me whether or not they eat pizza and whether or not they exercise. And that's an oversimplified example. Um, but that's that's an example of where you could take data, create a, a decision tree like this, and use it to predict uh, some outcome um, given the predicting variables of age, pizza consumption, and, and exercise. Um, if you apply that to uh, to to business process management and making um, uh, and making processes more efficient, uh, it's very applicable because if you think about it, when you decide, you, that, I mean, this is just one example of how you, you could have created a decision tree. Maybe the first decision isn't check if the age is over or, or under 30, but check if they exercise. And the, the point of a decision tree is you wanna separate as much as possible uh, people into categories as early as upfront as possible. So, so whatever decision separates the people um, into the biggest the 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 the, the biggest groups uh, initially is, is what you want to do. And so, you can apply those same concepts if you're designing a business process where some decision that needs to be made upfront uh, should just be made upfront because that'll dictate uh, a lot about how that that case is handled further along the line. Just a, a good example of this is um, with managing customers. So let's say that the process for managing a, you know, a diamond customer versus a gold customer based on past purchase dollar amounts is going to be much, much different. Um, so that's a decision that you should probably just make up front to say, you know, when this person calls in, do they even get a separate, um, uh, a separate process or is the process different enough uh, that we need to make that decision up front. And so that that's, you know, one way it applies, data mining applies. Uh, the other example is around pattern discovery and association rules. So you're basically trying to figure out correlations between data. I think if um, if anybody's worked in marketing or merchandising, you'll, you, you would have heard of the example of beer and diapers. Um, and I, I think it's been actually widely debunked um, that that anecdote, but but the story goes that um, people were looking at um, um, what what was being purchased at like receipts at 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 retail stores, and then what they were finding was that on Fridays, usually when people came in to buy uh, beer, they were also buying diapers, and they did some, and so that was a pattern that they discovered, an association they discovered, and so that was that naturally led to the conclusion that uh, they should put well. So that that led them to ask why, and and what they found was that you know husbands were getting sent off uh, to buy to buy to buy diapers on Friday, and since it was Friday, they they'd stop off at the liquor section and buy beer. Well, that led them to say maybe we should put the beer and diapers together. And I don't you know that's, like I said I don't you know that that story's been debunked, but that's a good example of um, of an association rule that you could potentially find. This is applicable to uh, to data to to uh, process mining because if you think about it, 
the process mining tool, all it's being given is it's being given a list of um, cases and the phases it went through. It's not being given um, anything other than that. It's creating a creating a process map. So what it's doing behind the scenes is this association rules and, and pattern discovery to say when A, B, and C happened, most likely uh, there's a high correlation that D is going to happen right after that. And so it's applying these rules behind the scenes um, um, to come up with that uh, to come up with that process map. Okay, um, and then uh, just some other benefits of uh, applying process mining uh, to BPM. I think it, I've touched on this a little bit already, but if you think about process discovery and just understanding, if you want to figure out uh, where to um, assign, where are your best bets for assigning your resources, whether it's whether it's people or or money or whatever, to making a process more efficient? It, you really have to understand what happens today, and so that's what we call process discovery. And that's just this is just a faster way to get to insights. Um, if you if you end up conducting interviews with with process owners, your interviews can just be much more pointed. You can ask pointed questions about well, you know. Uh, it looks like there were a lot of things happening after this decision. So tell tell me a little bit about about that. What decision was actually being made there, and can we, you know, can we make the decision earlier or later? It just it just makes the interviews more pointed. Um, the other thing is is to be able to look at performance, and um, and so you know, uh, being able to um, a lot of the process mining tools. Disco is an example that I showed you. You can actually look at, and you know, it'll animate um, cases going through the system, and so you can start to see where a lot of cases started to build up. It's a really cool visualization, actually, um, and a lot of tools that it will offer. You, you can see where cases start to build up, and they'll start to like, you know, a, a department will get a backlog of cases, and then and they're only able to get through them in, in certain num at a certain clip, and so you know that that's a place that you need to focus your energies on is to is to get that bottleneck. Uh, um, addressed, um, or looking at it and seeing unnecessary unnecessary loops that loop through, and and um, you could cut out a, a a whole section of a process entirely um, to to make the process uh, perform better. Um, and then the last thing is is conformance, and so you know um, you, you could you could take uh, what you've process mined. The, the data-driven version of the process, compare it to what the process owner says. Uh, and I think those are always interesting conversations to have to say, here's what you said the, you know, the, the process is or what you think the process should be. Here's what actually happens. Now let's talk about what the differences are. Those usually lead to some aha moments and some pretty good, uh, pretty good conversations. Uh, and then you know, some examples of, of where this is actually happening. I think the, the big one that a lot of people talk about is identifying automation opportunities, especially with you know uh, with the pandemic and and what's happening around. Well, eventually this is going to be over, and so how do we start to scale back up um, um, our our workforce, and how do we you know augment uh, the workforce that we have with with automation? And this isn't um, you know this is this is about basically taking. Uh, the mundane or very rules-based uh, parts of a person's job and, 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 and automating that so that they can um, work on more value-added activities. That, that's the thing, uh, at least with a lot of the, the companies that I work with, uh, has, has got the most interest in, uh, most, most interest these days. The other thing it does is um, tracking performance to results. I, you know, there, there's, there's a few clients have, have done this where you have to think about process mining as not just a one and done thing. Um, you know, when I was explaining what it was, uh, I talked a lot about getting event logs and loading that in. But another way of getting to that data is is directly connecting the process mining tool directly to the system itself so that it's pulling that data directly. Uh, the reason why you might want to do that instead of feeding it, you know, data extracts is because um, it will automatically come up with KPIs for your process around how, how long certain activities take to run. And so now when you go in and you improve a process, you can see in real time uh, how, how that improvement has impacted your KPIs. If, if that data, if your process mining tool is, is hooked up directly to, your, to the system. And so that's a good way of 
building a business case and it's a good way of um, justifying that the work the work that you've done around either re-engineering or changing a process to say look here are tangible results of of of, of what we've done um, uh, as a, as a result of the automation or any sort of improvements that we've made um, the other thing is mergers and acquisitions this is a you know this is a good one to look at where um, if 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 one company acquires another another uh, they'll have competing or, or duplicative processes. And so how do you decide which ones to keep or do you create some, some hybrid version of the two? And so process mining helps you, helps you do that. Um, and then the other, the other use case for process mining that, that we see a lot is, is around uh, compliance and, you know, uh, fraud detection and that sort of thing. Just the example with uh, paying invoices that, that I talked about a little bit earlier is, uh, you, you can look in there and you can see where potentially a an approval that should have happened didn't happen and the invoice got paid. Well, that the system, as long as it's in the system, process mining will catch that um, and, and visualize it. So you'll see you'll see those types of things. But uh, just you know, if you work in in risks and controls, you can start to see what uh, what some of the other benefits of knowing what your processes are doing um, would benefit you. Um, and just a just a before we move on to the next the next slide here, I will say that a lot of these things you're right. You might look at these and say, "Well, this is what business process management would have done anyways." The only difference that um, we're adding with process mining is that it's it's based off of you know system data and it's based off of what is actually happening, uh, as opposed to you know having a process map in Visio and trusting that everybody is following it and using that for, for compliance. Um, and then finally, uh, some key considerations, just having having done this a few times before, I think there's there's a lot of things that when people first hear about process mining, they, they, they think, you know, um, or they, they don't stop to consider upfront. And so these are just sort of like lessons learned that, um, that I will share with you. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not a cure all for for, for BPM, um, uh, there, there's some things that just need to be considered. One is um, data and connectivity to systems. Um, I, I don't think you can ever underestimate how long that takes. The actual work of, take, of um, performing the process mining and coming up with a process map, that, you know, that's, that's fairly relatively quick. What usually takes up all of the time is is getting the data extracted, making sense of it, especially if you're, you know, if you're if you're hooking up to like a standard SAP, like an ERP system where most people understand the data and the data model is in an industry standard, and you know, um, the process mining tool has standard connectors to it. That's not such a big issue. But when it's potentially a a custom uh, um, solution where the data model just takes a little bit of figuring out. Well, where are my activities? You know, back when I said that we only needed three attributes, oftentimes it's hard to figure out what data in the system is those three attributes, and um, data is not always labeled accurately. And so, it's a, so, and you know, it's usually an iterative process where you get the data. Uh, you think you understand what what it is. You go back to the source systems to me to, to to validate, and they give you some other data, and so you've got to join a bunch of data to to, to do that. And so that's. That can take some time um, there, so I, I would I would say that's that's usually the long pull in the tent, and you can never underestimate the time it takes to do that. Not unlike any you know data and analytics project, I uh, I will I will say. The other thing to to watch out for is uh, I I wouldn't completely abandon the classical method of of how BPM is done, where you're conducting interviews. Uh, with process owners and trying to understand what the process is. I think it's always interesting, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to compare what actually happens to what people think happens. Um, but but along the way, when you when you get to improving processes, it's always good to um, to to bring process owners and, and participants in the process along the way. Um, just um, just because you know. They're the ones that have the most insight into uh, into change management and how that's and how that's going to work. And um, 
and you just need ownership of any kind of improvements that you make. Um, and then finally, um, you, you may have, if you heard about the, when I was talking about the, the benefits of, uh, of process mining, it's a good way to check conformance against what actually happens to what should happen. I, I wouldn't look at non-conformance as all bad. The example I gave about um, an invoice being paid without, a, uh, without an approval, that's obviously bad, but there are going to be times where, you know, um, people that are executing the process have figured out better ways to do it. And so don't uh, dismiss them as necessarily bad. Uh, look, use them as input for how to re-engineer the process. And so um, th that's my point there about, uh, about not all non-conformance being bad. Uh, so that's, that's key considerations. Uh, that is, hopefully that helps uh, at least introduct, uh, uh, introductory information on what process mining is. I'm happy to answer any questions. My uh, my my contact info is on the slide there, and um, and uh, I'm open to open to questions. Sounds good, Kenny. Thanks. That was super interesting, really informative. I think uh, a lot of the audience will probably agree with me as well that it's you know I think so many times we talk about data science and we talk about oh, let's fix the screen here. Um, <laughs> we talk about um, you know. We talk about it in the abstract, but it's really fun and really interesting to go through some really specific examples of how you can really add value. Um, so I'm gonna kick it off with a question and then I'm going to get to Daniel Reese's question as well. And then for everyone else who hasn't uh, gone there yet, feel free to throw it in the comments. Um, but on my end, I, I curiosity, um, I'll, I'll poke into something that uh, you mentioned at the end as well, because I think that non conformity piece is actually super interesting. Um, However, who, uh, what, who, who are the stakeholders you're typically working with when you go through, when you uh, initiate a process like this? Yeah, um, so I can give you, I can talk about uh, some work that I've recently done. Our, our stakeholder was uh, the chief operating officer. He, he, um, he came from uh, GE who has a long history of you know, Lean Six Sigma, BPM, and so um, when he got to his new organization, he um, he, he saw that um, continuous improvement and, and process improvement wasn't really top of mind for some folks, and uh, and he also you know had an objective of of cutting costs, um, and so that was one way to do it was one way to get a handle on what what is happening today and and how to and how to um, and how to cut costs was to use process mining to do it. I think on a smaller scale, there have been smaller initiatives that we've we've worked on where um, the uh, the stakeholder is the process owner itself or that or the head of some department, whether it's um, whether it's a line of business or whether it's a whether it's a back office function. Um, oftentimes, it's um, it is a cost savings play. Yeah, so, that makes a ton of sense. Um, Daniel asked. Um, in your experience, Kenny, how, if at all, do you incorporate, uh, he called them process walks or uh, GEMBAs, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, G-E-M-B-A, apostrophe S, uh, to have a qualitative data, data source for process mining? Uh, sorry, Aaron, say, ask the question again. Sure, no problem. Um, he asked, um, I, I think what he's talking about, because um, what you talked about was a like very, um, uh, like, technical kind of feeding data into something. And I think he was asking more about, he called it a process walk, but I think also uh, qualitative. So in addition to like the numerical data or metrics you might pull from um, someone's database, you also incorporate uh, qualitative data as well. Uh, I'm not sure, I think maybe, I think you mentioned uh, doing interviews with stakeholders, uh, other kinds of stuff like that. Uh, tell me how, how do you kind of mix and match qualitative and quantitative? Yeah. Um you know, I so KPIs. You're right. Is an example of some some qualitative data that you can pull in there. Um, if you remember, one of the things I mentioned was uh, a lot of times the process mining is very sim is very similar to other data and analytics projects in in that usually you'll pull data to answer some question, and then and then the answer will will generate more questions 
which will require more data that you need to go back to pull more data to 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 do and it's and it's you know you get you answer more and more questions but you and using more and more data and so it's you're never actually done and so um the reason i'm bringing that up is you might start with quantitative data you might start with kpis and say wow this process takes a while uh, I need to figure out why it's taking so long. And then you might go back to the data systems and, and pull information like uh, employee name, which is you know uh, not quantitative or department that it work that, that that person is working in. And so then then you might if you if you went and pulled that data and you looked at it, you could um, do do some things on a dashboard like create a network graph of all of the places where an input from one department was an output um from another department and see wh which departments are uh working the closest together for a given process and uh, and does it make sense you know is is one is one process or is one case in a process being handled by everybody or is one person handling one type of of case uh those are like the the kinds of things that you could look at to diagnose uh issues around a qualitative measure sorry sorry a quantitative measure Excellent. Um, we just got a question from John. Um, he said, hey, Kenny, uh, really great overview. Your presentation briefly spoke about KPIs. Um, can you like, speak about how um, you use qualitative data to drive the conversation um, or either confirm assumptions? Um, uh, maybe kind of a rehashing of, of, of uh, some of the stuff we just talked about. But Yeah, I mean, to, to summarize, uh, you can look at both. Uh, it, oftentimes you won't know exactly what you, you need to go after right away. So like a, a lot of times what we do is we'll pull in just basic information around like person's name, department, location, cost. Uh, and those are qualitative things that you can look at. And then you'll certainly have more questions when you look at uh, the numbers. What about, um, I mean, you briefly mentioned something about this earlier, but um, when you dive into, when you're given a, a, an assignment or a project, um, are, are you often uh, kind of the, like making new KPIs um, for that for that team or that, that company, or how, how do you go about uh, figuring out what the right thing to measure or, or what you should be going after? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, usually, um, we are we are given the given the KPI. I mean, usually the usually there's some KPI we know we want to improve. For example. Um, you know, if you're if you're looking at um, if you're looking at a certain function in a in a company, um, you want to improve the efficiency of it. And so, most of the times, like the clients that I work with, they have KPIs that they they already use that they want to that they want to bring down. Uh, and so, we're just using process mining to um, to help them do that. Awesome. Well, we give give everyone another couple of minutes to to ask additional questions. I'll kind of do the moderator's prerogative. Um, and, and keep picking your brain because I think there's there's a lot of a lot of really good information that you presented us with. But um, I know a lot of folks joining the talk today um, might not be necessarily deep in the analytics space right now. Um, but I, a lot of folks are kind of have you know are different functional areas. I know there's a lot of product people, some marketers, um, some you know folks who are analysts here. Um, thinking back to your uh, career, um, I, I have like kind of two related questions. Um, one, uh, for someone who, you know, you're probably good at Excel, but kind of you want to know what, what you should be doing on, on, on the tech side, um, what do you think, what's like the first thing that you should you should learn or first couple of things um, that would be good to, to start diving into? Um, and then I'll, I'll save my second question for after you finish answering this first one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, so uh, when I when I started my career, I started out as an ETL developer on a large data warehouse implementation. And ETL, if you're not aware, just stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. And it's basically uh, the tool that a lot of people, that a lot of data engineers and people like that use to to extract data out of a system, transform it to get it to you know do something else and load it. Um, in the course of doing that, though. Um, you really have to understand uh, the data in a system and how they relate to each other. And in order to do that, you really have to understand the the data model that's being used, whether it's a 
you know, whether it's a star schema or a third normal form, I think, um, I think that the tools will change, uh, tools have and will change uh, at a faster and faster rate. Um, methods will change, but, but what you really should do is understand um, data modeling concepts and how they apply to the real world, just as an example. Uh, if, if I have two tables that I need to pull data from, one is, um, you know, uh, an address, like a home location, like an address, and, and another one is uh, customer ID. Uh, I know that um, a, an address or a house can have more than one customer living in the house. And so if I have two tables that store that information, I know how I need to join it so that I can get the you know information the way I need. If you don't understand that and you don't understand how the data model is, is configured that way to reflect reality, the, the way that you join and pull data or run SQL and, and pull that data out could could uh, could not be representative of what you of what you think. So, so you know, I, I know a lot of people like ask about what tools they should learn, but I think just understanding data and, and how their relationships are to each other uh, and how they are modeled after reality is uh, would be my um, would be my first thing. Yeah, no, I, I, we I think that's definitely um, a, a big theme. I mean, I tell people all, all the time, like tools change. Like whether you're, you know, usually we get asked like, what's the best uh, data visualization tool or you know whatever. And you know, some people like Power BI, some people like Tableau. Uh, my answer is very similar. It's always pick one. They're going to change whatever, whichever one your company has, as long as you get data viz practices. Um, either way, you'll, you'll you'll be good to go. Um, kind of to pick back off of that. Um, is there something um, thinking back kind of in, in, in your career, I guess, whether it's like something you would do differently or, or also just like kind of piece of advice you'd give to folks who are either uh, thinking about, you know, diving into a, 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 you know, data career or just, you know, there's a lot of folks here who are kind of you know, at that manager level and really we just want to get better at you know, ultimately making better business, business decisions. Um, we'll be able to speak to that and then uh, I think we're, We'll have you know time for one more question. If anyone is is uh, has a burning question, then we'll we'll shut it down because I think we've we've had you for forty eight minutes here, so um, I, I know it's definitely a lot of talking. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, I mean, I think if there was a lesson learned in in my career, uh, it was and and you know this isn't necessarily a, a be this wouldn't be something that I would this this was just my own personal lesson learned. Um, was was to was to understand the um, not understanding the business aspect of what I was doing early enough in my career. I think at 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 a at at like midpoint in my career, I think if you asked me uh, what I was doing, my answer my answer to that question would very would be very technical and very and very data focused. Mm -hmm. And if it were somebody like a CFO or or a chief marketing officer asking me the question, they they still wouldn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> so, um, uh, what I what I learned, um, I think, too late uh, for me at least was was being able to to say what I was doing, but but how that actually impacted uh, impacted the business. So, how you as a CMO, if you're asking me what I was what I was helping your organization with, what does that mean to the chief marketing officer? What does that mean to the um, you know? Uh, to, to the business side of it, as opposed to yeah, we're we're managing data on the back end, and, and in the end, you'll have much better data. Well, that that's a super good point. Um, it's it's really interesting that like you bring that up now, and there are a lot of companies I talk to now that have reached out to Mobile for for training and what have you. And, and once I start kind of peeling back that onion of, of like what what are you looking to solve here, um, so often it's that they forget that that thing that you you know you learn when you write your first essay, right? What's your thesis statement? What are we trying to do? And then everything else, it's like then you pick your tool, then you do everything else. Um, so that's that's really, I'm really happy <laughs> that that uh, you're also in alignment there. And I think for everyone else, um, I think this has been a really amazing talk. Um, if you're still on LinkedIn, please uh, give us a, an applause. Um, I know it's it's always, you know, challenging to kind of, you know, feel like you're, you're, you're there, you know, like we used to do it more in, in person. Um, but I think, you know, Definitely, I think this was super insightful. I really enjoyed it. Um, for everyone that's watching, we will be recording this. We're posting it to the YouTube channel, um, so you can go ahead and rewatch it, um, kind of take some notes. Um, and then uh, I know Kenny at one point put up his uh, contact information, so 
feel free to, to send them a note on, on LinkedIn. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn off here. Um, if you're still online, please, please uh, like us on LinkedIn, like us on Twitter, shoot us some questions. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, send that to hello at promotable.io. Uh, always looking for um, ideas for uh, content or stuff you guys would like to learn. Um, all of that would be super helpful. So um, with that, Kenny, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get the podcast here and then uh, take it.